Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. In this episode, Martha Tatarnik welcomes Callie Swanland to the show. Callie Swanland is an Episcopal priest, retreat leader, spiritual companion, and coach who helps others know their belovedness and find their spark. Her new book, From Weary to Wholehearted, is a restorative resource for overcoming ministry burnout. Callie is a creative minister and leads individuals and groups in the work of Dr. Brene Brown as a certified Daring Way facilitator. Her How To Eucharist, digital instructed Eucharist film, has reached Christians and curious individuals around the world, and her wholehearted wisdom movement invites others into deeper reflection and connection across social media. Callie is an Episcopal Church Foundation Fellow and has keynoted such conferences as Canuga Christian Formation Conference, Episcopal Communicators Annual Conference, and Episcopal Camps and Conference Center's Annual Conference. She lives in Philadelphia with her co-dreaming partner, Jeremy, their two tween teen children, and a rescue pup named Rufus. One more thing, please take a moment to leave a review on whatever podcast app you're listening on and share this episode with a friend. We do hope this episode guides you and your church into your future ministry. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. I am your host for the summer season, Martha Tatarnik, and today I am very pleased to be joined by the Reverend Callie Swanland for a conversation about her new book. Welcome to the podcast, Callie. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I've been um, uh, looking what, at what y'all do, and I'm really excited to be in conversation with you, Martha. Thanks, Callie. Well, we're going to set the stage a little bit here to begin with and just get to know you a little, Callie. So if you can um, start by just telling us a bit about the faith context in which you were raised, whether you were raised in the church or or not. Yeah, so born and raised in the Episcopal Church. Um, I uh, actually, the church I was baptized at, um, uh, I went back to in college when I was trying to start an Episcopal campus ministry at my um, at my university, and so um, kind of came around full circle after having been away from that town for most of my growing up, um, and um, so uh, stayed in the Episcopal church, um, and after college uh, went on to seminary and made. Uh, made a lifetime vocation out of it by um, becoming an Episcopal priest. Well, that sounds very similar to my trajectory, although I wasn't born in the Anglican Church, mm-hmm. of course, in Canada, it's Anglican. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, about the age of seven or eight was when my family started. And uh, yeah, so similar, beautiful, similar life paths. Yeah. Um. That being said, you know, having spent your whole life basically in the same denomination, do you have a sense of how being a Christian has changed for you or just changed in general over the course of uh, yeah. that growing up and living out your vocation? Absolutely. I mean, the church in a lot of ways was always um, my refuge, my safe space. Um, uh I, you know, struggled with feelings of belonging in high school. I did have a number of friends across different friend groups, but it was, um, I was at youth gatherings and, and, um, diocesan church events where I was like, Oh, this is, this is my real authentic self. And, um, that's, that's where my call was originally rooted was wanting, to have that experience of belonging, wanted to, wanting mm. to bring that experience of belonging to others. Um, but in, in college, I was a women in gender studies minor and, um, I, um, a lot of those people in my program really wanted nothing to do with religion or the church, um, yeah. for a variety of reasons. Um, some of them, were so far left in their politics that they thought, you know, church and state, these don't have anything to say to each other. Um, a lot of them had been, been hurt or been excluded mm-hmm. because of their sexuality or gender identity. And 
it was the same affirmation of call that I had experienced in high school, but it was a shift on that because um, what those peers told me is they said, there's a place where someone who looks like you could be a leader and someone who looks like me could be welcomed in. Um, and I realized that the belonging that I had taken for granted wasn't available to all. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that really has been a, a focus of my call, my ministry since. Um, and there are so many things that have changed about the church, so many things that have changed about um, ministry or the nostalgia of of what ministry used to look like, whether it actually did or not. I'm not sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a lot of nostalgia um, for the church that once was. And um, I sometimes feel that and experience that too. And um, I also feel excited about what, is being pushed away to make room for something new. Hmm, that's beautifully said. I really yeah. love that. Yeah. Um, I, again, you know, growing up in the mainline church and the mm -hmm. Anglican church, as well as growing up in a small rural town, mm -hmm. um, it was the church where I learned my most inclusive values mm -hmm. that were quite in contrast to the the small town in which I grew up, and uh, it, it's a very different church formation experience than mm -hmm. a, a lot of people have. And again, Absolutely. it's easy to take that for granted. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm grateful for that. And I want to help ensure that others might feel included or feel like they have a place if mm -hmm. they do choose to come into a church. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I think, too, like just an awareness of how even in the liberal mainline church, we're always still a work in progress and yes. yeah. have new things to learn about inclusion all the time. Can you tell me a little bit about your current ministry context, Callie? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, the first um, almost decade of my ordained ministry um, I served in pretty traditional um, parish-based ministry um, models, uh, associate rector, senior associate rector, um, those sorts of things. And um, in 2018, I left full-time parish ministry to um, try doing a hybrid of um, what I was feeling called to at that time was a uh, teaching, leading, creating, and gathering community, and trying to figure out what all that looked like. Um, I thankfully had a loving congregation, um, a, a wonderful friend who was the rector of a parish, where I was able to be half-time in the parish and half-time building this creative ministry. And um, I was there for four years, um, which was such a gift. They were a, a, mm. a loving congregation that understood um, their clergy having creative gifts and um, encouraged us to flourish. And what I, what I thought I was doing pre-pandemic um, uh, shifted quite a bit right. in, in the pandemic. I thought I was going to be building um, a brick and mortar co-working space for creatives to come together and um, have space to work with me on, on figuring out their, their spark, their, their dreams, their mm. um, big gifts and having space to create that in community with others and then share that. And um What's funny is that even though I felt really relieved to not have a brick and mortar space when March 2020 rolled around, right? Um, I realized that I could create all of those same things without having a building. I could still gather community. I could still help people find their spark. Um, and so uh, in the last couple of years, I've been fully, um, uh, fully employed by my own creative ministry, which is um, uh, 
my percentages are off. I usually say it's half this and half this, and I add three extra things in. So yeah. <laughs> um, uh, creative ministry is not a 100% calculation. Um, there's a lot more to it. But about um, about half of my time and my focus is on doing companioning work. It's a hybrid of um coaching and spiritual companioning. Um, I'm trained in the work of Dr. Brene Brown. Um, yes. And so I bring that skill set and I have um, numerous people that I companion because I think we all need companions on the journey. So between companioning and traveling around leading retreats, those are the two big pieces. But um, I am blessed to be at a congregation on Sundays. Um, they have a rector. And so I'm not doing any of the administrative work. I'm showing up and um, loving them and celebrating and preaching and being a pastoral presence. And it's just delightful. Um, and so my ministry is a little bit of everywhere right now. And I love that. I love, I love traveling to people. I love gathering with people um, all over the world. So far, um, my retreats have only been in the United States, but I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to expand beyond that. Branch um, out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations. That sounds like a wonderful ministry context in which to serve. Is there among all of uh, that mm -hmm. creative, um, space that you're creating, is there a spiritual practice that you're finding particularly meaningful right now? Yeah. Um, so when I launched my book a few weeks ago, I, um, I will, and we'll talk about book stuff, I'm sure, um, in a moment, but, um, I wanted, I wanted a different experience, um, than just a traditional book talk. And so I invited people, it was completely optional, but I invited people to come to a um, micro retreat beforehand. So it was an hour of micro retreat and an hour of a more traditional book talk, book signing, et cetera. And um, for the micro retreat, I brought, brought in a local um, uh, sound healing or sound bath practitioner um, who brought in the big... Uh, singing bowls and um, set them on the labyrinth in the church and um, surrounded us in sound. And uh, it was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And sound bath has been, sound healing has been um, something that I've found grounding, especially in this past year. Um, uh, sometimes I watch it on YouTube. If I, if I can be immersed in it in person, um, I do that, but it's, it's a great form of meditation for me because it's, um, it's somatic. It, it, it connects with our bodies and I immediately right, yeah. find calming and clarity of mind and just presence of the holy. Um, and, uh, so that's been one of my favorite newer, spiritual practices that I've incorporated into, you know, other things like scripture and more traditional prayer. But uh, I love, um, there's just so much science out there on um, the healing powers of sound. And I mean, we know that intuitively and we know that within the church world already that music and sound and um, vibrations and intonations are part of our tradition and have um have been one thing that has not changed much throughout the centuries is having an accompaniment of of sound well yeah i mean i find that very interesting the way that you kind of framed that as in contrast to more traditional prayer methods but actually it's quite an ancient it's, right uh, <laughs> it is way ancient. of praying isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> sometimes the ancient feels like it it um jars people a bit because they think oh, it's yeah, for sure. something um really new and different um, yeah like but, new age but yeah <laughs> we're getting in touch with ancient roots which i think is why my soul immediately feels at peace in those spaces yeah beautiful Okay, well, we are here today to talk primarily about your book, 
and it is called From Weary to Wholehearted, a Restorative Resource for Overcoming Clergy Burnout. So I want to start with what inspired you to write this book. Um, This is definitely a recurring topic for us here at Future Christian. We get a variety of perspectives from people in different parts of the church and different denominations around uh, that burnout question and what is really at the heart of that. Um, What were you seeing and experiencing around clergy burnout that led you to write this book? A um being an individual companion to people and a retreat leader for people throughout the pandemic, I watched what to me felt like an alarming number of people come to me in some sort of ministry crisis, whether they were clergy or um, lay ministry professionals. Um, a lot of them were leaving traditional contexts or taking leaps of absence. Um, uh, things that seemed just raised my antenna at first as to, okay, this seems more widespread than I had realized. And, um, as you know, you know, clergy therapists, certain practitioners behind closed doors get a lot of the information that people aren't necessarily sharing at coffee hour or in, yeah. in casual conversation. And, um, And one of the things that a um, dear friend of mine, um, Heidi Carrington Heath, who is a UCC pastor, she and I put our heads together in fall of 2020 and said, um, how do we heap nourishment upon our sibling clergy, specifically on um, clergy women? And we started this series of um, seasonal Advent and Lenten uh, digital retreats. And people were so hungry to gather together and um, just know that they weren't alone and know that their weariness was welcome there. And uh, we called those love letters to uh, our sibling clergy. And that, that plus this, this movement that I started years ago on social media called wholehearted wisdom where um, I call it a weekly-ish reflection. It used to be weekly, but, you know, life. Um, it's a weekly-ish yeah. reflection to push back on the the vitriol and the isolation that we often encounter on social media and instead offer a reflection and some questions that I found that people, strangers would sort of engage with each other or encourage each other in the comments. I started this back in 2018 and um just seeing the need for us to come together more um alongside people just burning out i wondered how again that question how could i heap nourishment on people there are plenty of beautiful books out there on burnout that are more academic or clinical um and i really wanted a pastoral note that if people read nothing else if if they came away with nothing else after reading the book, they would at least come away with the feeling that they were not alone. Um, yeah. And I hope they come away with all the tools and tips and everything else that I shared too. But like at the very minimum, just normalizing their experience and saying what you are experiencing here is not unique. Um, so, uh, you know, I set out to write that book that offered nourishment, that offered rest inside its pages, not just something to be consumed, but I wanted an embodied experience so that people felt refreshed. So in that like companioning space that you're creating, and I agree, I mean, it is amazing how much burnout and isolation can go hand in hand, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, but uh, like, do you have a sense of where the greatest pressure points are for people in leadership in our church? (laughs) Um, I laugh a little bit because early in the process, um, I surveyed some clergy 
in, in early in the process of writing, I surveyed a number of clergy to say, you know, here are some things that I plan to address in this book, boundaries and isolation and um, uh, loneliness and a sense of um, helplessness or compassion fatigue. I listed off all these things and I said, um, what am I missing? You know, what, what else? And um, I got really uh, overwhelmed by the responses. A lot of them were systemic things. Um, mm. A lot of people were like, oppression, patriarchy, heterosexism. And I was like, absolutely, absolutely. And so in the book, I absolutely addressed those. But what I was looking for was also, um, those are those are external factors that are at, at play and absolutely need to um, be dismantled. And if I am the one experiencing burnout and weariness, um, I'm not going to be able to be the one who does the dismantling of those things. And right. so I chose in my book to focus on some of the other ones that I was hearing, which, like I said, um, uh, boundaries, saying yes to some of the things that we love and no to some of the things that drain us, etc. Um, I think, uh, I think comparison and um, and isolation slash loneliness are two of the biggest factors I see. And comparison comparison works in a multitude of ways because we we compare ourselves to people who are um, thriving as well as people who we perceive as. Um, not that as having a harder time than us. And so we don't share, we don't share our joys or our sorrows with one yeah, another. It's so true. <laughs> Success and failure is really hard to talk about oh in the gosh. life of the church. Yeah. And, you know, what gets lost in all of that is not only the companionship piece, but yeah. an ability to learn, you know, like absolutely to, to be learning as we go. And my goodness, like in this time of transitional time in the life of the church, we need to be learning. Like, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I feel like, um, there's so much to be said on that. Um, but if we're, I, I work with a number of people who I would d put in the camp of weary clergy. And then I work with a few folks who would definitely be in the camp of thriving clergy. And they're struggling too because, yeah. like I said, they don't have um, spaces or outlets. A lot of people feel like they're, you know, flaunting it if they say something about their, their thriving, which we should celebrate each other's joy. That's, yeah. that's a, that's a gift too. That is something we're called to as well. So I think it's, um, it just and and the literal isolation of the pandemic just caused people to go really, really interior. Um, yeah, and I think we're learning to trust again, to be vulnerable again. Vulnerability is an interesting one too, because it's not just um, vulnerability is so deeply important for personal growth and for relationship building. But if someone is um, uh, practicing vulnerability and they're also in a parish leadership role, then there's some questions of who can I be vulnerable with? What can I share um, as a leader with my congregation about my struggles and what I'm going through as well? Um, so for clergy or for someone sort of in an outward facing serving role, um, there are very few spaces for them to be fully authentic and that wears on people. Yeah, I really want to unpack that a little bit more yeah. because that has come up a couple of times in some of our other conversations around clergy burnout. And I mean, I can certainly speak from my experience being in parish ministry that um, there is kind of this impossible ask of us, which is that like yeah. we, we do deeply love our people. And we are on 
uh, an authentic journey with them. And we need to be in order to be effective in our work. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, when it comes to times of sorrow, when it comes to um, helping people through grief and anxiety and loss and so on, yeah. um, we suddenly have to be the professional who is the one who, you know, holds it all together for the community who um, just like carries all of that in some kind of yeah. um well, professional way, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I'm just wondering, like, what would you want faith leaders to hear about any practices or tips about how to manage that particular balancing act? Because it is mm -hmm. tricky to say, to say the least, right? Absolutely, it's tricky. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and um. I will say to a lot of us are talking about how the church has changed and how ministry has changed since the start of the pandemic. But um, there was another catalyst right around the start of the pandemic that I, I'm curious about in um, other parts of the Anglican communion in, in Canada, but in, in the United States, when George Floyd was murdered, um, that also sent a lot of people into this place of like, um, what am I doing to make a difference in this world? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that tension of holding their community and um, attending to their own needs as well. Um, and so um, one of the things, <laughs> one of the many, many tips and tools that I share in my book um, is that one of my clients talks about her it crew. And I love this metaphor. Um, she talks about having a coach, a spiritual director, and a therapist. Um, okay. And so the three of those are her, are her it crew. And um, I think the biggest thing is having a support system, sometimes of paid professionals. And um, right. I've, I've shared this at some conferences, at some keynotes where people have said, you know, like, what if we don't have the resources for this? Um, in the church, I believe we should be taking care of each other. If you're, um, you know, go, go to your bishop, go to someone and say, you know, please, please help me with these funds. But what I find about, um, uh, some paid professional relationships is, um, for myself that it, it, allows me the space to say, I don't need to hold this other person here. I care. I care about my um, support professionals. I care about them deeply. But um, we have so many contexts. I think even in casual encounters with neighbors on the street where we are just donning our pastoral persona. Right. And right. can't just just be. So, so my um, recent example of this is um, uh, I just had to get hearing aids in the last few weeks. And part of the hearing aid process is that you go back and forth to the audi audiologist a few times to check the levels and everything. And I was in um, a week or two ago, I was in my um, audiologist's appointment and she asked me how things were going. And, you know, she meant how things were going with my hearing aids. And I, I burst into tears in her office. And at first I thought, this is so strange. And then I thought, no, this makes complete sense. This is a professional who is holding space for me, who I don't need to hold space for. Right. And yeah. when she asked how things were going, I, um, I was able to show up fully for that. So I think having spaces where we're not responsible for, um, for others. Um, I usually, um, have a few tears at the beginning of my retreats when I say, um, in this space, nothing is required of you. Right. Um, we have so many spaces, whether we are, I mean, I'm also, um, a parent of a tween and a teen, um, and, uh, have plenty of other areas of responsibility. And so, uh, even if I'm not working or writing or, um, 
over the church preaching or whatever it might be, um, I am responsible pretty mm-hmm. much all the time. And so having spaces um, where you're not responsible. Um, one more thing I'll add, because I could go on for hours on this. Um, one of the, the central tenets of my book is uh, retreat. And um, it's literally retreat means time set apart. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think we imagine that as, you know, four nights away uh, at a monastery or some sort of retreat center or something. And that's lovely. I would love to send everyone on a retreat like that. And uh, we've got to start with um, what's possible right in front of us, time-wise, money-wise, responsibility-wise, et cetera. Um, you can have a 15-minute retreat by closing a door, uh, turning this, you know, the sound uh, healing sound bath YouTube channel on and meditating for 15 minutes. That is, that is retreat. Um, I talk about an on-ramp to retreat. I use this with my clients who are like getting really crispy and about to burn out um, or haven't been on a retreat in a long time or ever. And I say, okay, I'm giving you three tasks. Look at your calendar for the next week and find an hour. Find one open hour that you can claim for retreat or move something aside if you don't have a single open hour. That's possible for most people to find one hour in the next week. Now look at your calendar for the next month and choose a half day option. Now look at your calendar for the next six to 12 months and choose a full day or an overnight option. Like that on ramp helps, helps people feel like they can actually take that space um, away from all of the many, many um, responsibilities that we're carrying. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that. I mean, um, I'm a runner and, uh, one of the many benefits of being a runner, especially when I'm training for something is that I literally build into my schedule, Mm. like time for myself, right? Because I'm, I'm training and I have to do it. And like, it is just, you know, right. It's like tithing. It's like right off the top. That time is set aside. Yeah. And like yeah. It's time set aside to show up for myself. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that you uh, say in the book that I appreciate is like rest is resistance. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of just permission giving that I hear Absolutely. in your work yes. about telling leaders it is okay to show up for yourself. Absolutely. It is okay to claim your own needs in the midst of all of the other needs that you're trying to attend to. Amen. Um, Amen. And why, do you, why do you think that's so hard for us? Like, I think you're really good at like saying that to other people, right? Yeah. But, like, why is it yeah. so hard for us? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so many things are easier said than done. And I often sit in this seat and, you know, dole out permission or advice to others and then, uh, really need to look hard in, in the mirror and say, okay, I also need to receive that as well. Um, uh, a note on the rest is resistance. Um, I, you know, uh, I borrow that from Trisha Hersey and um, her work uh, with the NAP ministry and highly commend, highly commend her work. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there are so many intersections here. Um, uh, a lot of the people I work with uh, identify as women, not exclusively, but mostly. Um, and so you also have... Um, uh, often you have gender expectations and other things in there, right. which um, uh, only fully solidify the "I have to be everything to everyone all the time." Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, but I, but I would say it goes beyond gender. Um, uh, there are plenty of people who have um, uh, who have elders or children in their care, others that feel like. Um, 
you know, even if I could take time away from work, I can't justify taking time away from these other people. Um, we are in, we live in a capitalistic society that, um, tells us that what we produce, uh, is who we are. And, um, Mm. we go around and we ask each other, um, uh, it's so nice to meet you. What do you do? (laughs) What do you do? What do you do? Right. And so, um, so there's already this like built in societal push for, um, for production and excellence. And, um, uh, then there's a a whole, whole, whole chapter. We could, we could have another podcast on just the influence of shame alone. Um, that goes along with comparison, like I talked about earlier, but, um, we all have these, um, unwanted identities and they are things like, um, the voices that go through our head that may be, um, someone said to us as a child, or we somehow internalized, um, things like, well, um, you're lazy or you're not working hard enough. Um, you're not working to your full potential, whatever, whatever voices those might be. Um, they're, they're wicked and evil and they stick with us and they come out, especially in times of stress. So if Mm -hmm. we're already in a time of stress and we encounter a negative internal voice, we're more likely to believe it or less likely to examine that it's even and identify it even as shame. Um, And so what I struggle with, with people who um, uh, are, are needing that, rest and looking for that permission is that they don't trust and believe that they deserve it. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's a basic building block of that. Yeah. I mean, I think that all of those insights are really extremely important, not just in the people that you work with, but for any of the people who are listening into this conversation to be able to do that deep dive into their own uh, mm-hmm. inner voices and what Absolutely. what uh, prevents us from kind of claiming our own needs. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that uh, before we wrap up our conversation that you have a chance to break down that word spark yeah. for our listeners because mm-hmm. you did mention it at the outset. It is a pretty important organizing principle of the book and each of the letters in the word spark stand for something a nice little way of reminding (laughs) ourselves of different ways that we can get grounded and nourished so why don't you tell us about that absolutely so um uh i started several years ago talking about our purpose or meaning as our spark. And I found that a lot of people understood that much better than um, uh, church lingo, like vocational discernment. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Um, It's not quite as snappy. (laughs) Right. Um, And and so um, I I view this um, spark practice that I put at the center of my book as as a catalyst, a spark is a catalyst, right? Like it's not, mm. um, it's, it's a, it's a fire starter. It's not the whole thing. So I've just wanted right. people to have some things to, um, to things that you can grab onto even today. Like they don't require a bunch of equipment. They don't require a bunch of prep. Uh, what can you do to start yourself on a journey toward flourishing? So the S-P-A-R-K have um, uh, a, a different practice that goes with each. S is nurture my soma, which is body, um, mm-hmm. uh, which side note, um, in uh, the Greek New Testament, soma appears like 140 times. And it's not just uh, relating to our human body, but also um, the constellations, the, oh, um, who knew? yes, cool. <laughs> the, the body of stars. And, um, so nurture my soma is the bodily part. Um, engage in preparation is more of the, the mental part, but it includes things like, 
um, mindfulness practice. I call it the least sexy um, uh, spoke of this wheel because preparation um, often is met with like a eye roll. Um, but uh, preparation is what I think of our Jewish siblings engaging in when um, leading up to the Sabbath. They don't just arrive on Saturday and say, oh, I'm just taking today off. They do a lot of prep work to prepare the meals and run the errands ahead of time so that they can truly engage in that deeply important work of Sabbath. Um, uh, the center letter A is awe, make space for awe. And mm-hmm. um, it's, uh, it's absolutely the center. This is the spiritual piece. Um, uh, awe helps us know that we are part of something so much bigger than us. Um, and that helps us feel more connected when we feel isolated from things. Um, so, so far you've got mind, no, um, body, mind, and spirit with the first right. three. So the fourth one is claim retreat. It's that time set apart. And the fifth one is ground myself in kinship, which I would say is the opposite of retreat. It's sort of going um, uh, going back toward deep connection with others, but also um, our indigenous siblings would describe kinship as our um our tether, our invisible string, as um, uh, Caitlin Curtis would say, um, with the earth. And Taylor Swift. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, So how do we, how do we deeply um, connect? Um, That's kinship. So um, I feel like a balance of uh, Soma preparation, awe, retreat, and kinship um, would be be a robust spiritual practice if we were to weekly sort of look at am i am i attending to all of these things in in some way shape or form um all of them are things that lead to um to health to um to rest um they're 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 the sorts of positive experiences that beget more positive experiences because we know that negativity begets more negativity. Um, Mm -hmm. So things like awe, once we start searching for awe, once we start claiming awe, we notice more things that bring us awe. Um, So, so all of these are things that build, um, build on the previous as well. Yeah. I really like, um, I like that breakdown because it, isn't prescriptive. It's not like, okay, you need to tick mm-hmm. all five boxes. It's about like being holistic. It's yeah. about recognizing that these things kind of need to exist in balance with one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like the, you know, the food pyramid got thrown out a long time ago. Um, and they started saying like, uh, this was a relief for, for parents. They said like, if your kids aren't eating vegetables every day, that's fine. Like what we're looking for is like a balance throughout the course of a week. Are they eating vegetables some days? Are they eating fruit some days? Like, does it round out at some point? Um, We're just looking for, for a, for it to round out and for, for people to feel nourished. I use that word over and over again, because I think nourished um, it, it makes my soul feel, um, held um there's something about nourished that requires even if it's toward yourself it requires a holding it requires an intentionality so just quickly before we um wrap up this section of our conversation uh take a quick break i i know that you said earlier like we are not exactly as individuals equipped to dismantle whole systemic uh, toxic Mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. But I do wonder, like, if we just kind of focus on the system of the church, yeah, would there be like one or two things that you would like to see changed systemically in the church that would foster wellness for our leaders? Because, yeah, you know, you are very much Mm -hmm. concerned about what we can like empowering individuals, what we can do yeah. as individuals, but we do exist mm. within systems that can be quite toxic. Absolutely. So like if you could wave a magic wand, yeah, what would it be? Yeah. Um, I think there's, um, 
there is still a narrative that um, church equals gospel. And I don't know that all bodies of faith are functioning with the gospel at their forefront with, um, uh, as our presiding Bishop Michael Curry would say, if it's not about, if it's not about God, it's not about, if it's not about love, it's not about God. If it's not about love, it's not about God. Like where's the, where's the accountability for, um, the bad behavior. And I'm not just talking about, we have accountability for the big bad behaviors. Um, but the ways that we um, allow uh, vestry members or parishioners to treat their clergy, um, and there's no, you know, they can come and yell at clergy, but clergy um, can't or shouldn't, quote unquote, shouldn't uh, behave that way back toward our parishioners. Um, well, where's, where's the part, where's the biblical principle that we, um, if someone sinned against us, we go to them in private. And then if they continue, we bring another person. And then if they continue, we bring the whole community. Um, uh, I think that there's, um, gotta be accountability for being members of community together. Um, uh, that even if we disagree on things, um, how are we acting in love toward each other mm -hmm. or or in respect toward one another? Our baptismal covenant, um, in our baptismal covenant, we vow to respect the dignity of every human being. Um, so uh, in some ways, I'd like us to have more um, accountability and um, uh, what Brene Brown calls brave conversations, um, which everyone seems to like get really nervous when I start talking about brave conversations, but brave conversations, um, uh, allow us to repair, um, brokenness in community. They allow us to call out things that, um, are harmful to ourselves or to others. Um, they allow us to come to an empathetic understanding of one another. Um, so, um, that is one of the big things that I, um, advocate for and lead people into. Yeah, I think that those brave conversations um, are just so important in anxious systems, you know, to hold ourselves to brave conversations because yeah. there is so much anxiety around mm -hmm. decline, around secularism, around saving the institution. And yes. those brave conversations are just going to become more and more essential if we are going to mm -hmm. have any prayer of having yeah. a glimmer of living the gospel through it all right you, absolutely I, I really co-sign that absolutely okay well let's uh let's close there um take a quick break and we'll come back for our rapid fire questions okay Welcome back to Future Christian Podcast. I continue to be with Callie Swanland in our conversation around her book, From Weary to Wholehearted. And uh, we're just going to close out with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready, Callie? I think so. Okay. Well, if you were hope for a day, what would that day look like? If I were pope for a day, is that the question? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can take this as seriously yep. or as not as you want. <laughs> I would I would go to those faithful dedicated women who have been working uh toward women's um inclusion and ministry in the Catholic Church and I would just go and have a mass ordination of them and uh tell them what a blessing their gifts are. Good job. Okay, I'll come <laughs> along for that. Yes. <laughs> Send me an invitation. <laughs> um, what theologian or historical Christian figure would you want to meet, have supper with, bring back to life? Oh, my gosh. Oh, um, I think I think one of the – oh, my gosh, so many options. But rapid fire, I would just say um, – I would say Julian, like I would love to talk to, 
um, an early church mother and, um, and understand what their experience was like. And also, um, uh, some of the, the mystics, um, visions are quite radical. Um, yeah, so, I know. right. I mean, so radical. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk to some of the mystics and early church mothers, um, and just have a round table with them and, uh, feel empowered by them. Yeah. I think you can invite more than one guest yeah, to this. We'll have a party supper table. <laughs> <for sure. laughs> what will history remember from our current time and place? Oh my gosh. I, I, I pray that, um, it's like the Mr. Rogers thing that, that they remember the helpers, that they remember the people that, um, stand up for the weary and the oppressed and the war torn. Um, uh, that is my hopeful outlook. Um, mm. I am, uh, I am so weary when I look at the ways in which we are tearing ourselves down and tearing each other apart right now. Um, so, uh, uh, please God, you know, give us the strength to, to stand and to change that history, to see the people who are making a difference, the, the, um, college students who are standing up for what they believe in, um, the incredible, the generation, um, Gen Z is just giving me so much hope for what's, what's ahead. Hmm. Yeah, I love that uh, choosing a hopeful and prayerful slant on that. Game, so yeah, it's great. yeah. And uh, just along those same lines, what are your hopes for the future of Christianity? Hmm. I, um, my dear friend Hillary Raining, um, keeps talking about this time as um, the 500 year Renaissance, and I'm really excited about what that looks like. I think that, um, I think that Sunday morning worship will still remain a, um, central tenant, but I don't know th that it's going to be the end all and be all of how we gather. And I'm actually really excited about that. I'm really excited to see the ways in which we gather in expansive, uh, not yet dreamed of ways that we are able to um, get outside of our um, rigid expectations and boxes of Christianity and um, truly, truly uh, be disciples who live out Jesus's radical love and uh, aren't afraid to invite others into that. Beautiful. And finally, where can people find out more about you, Callie? Yeah. So I am Callie Swanland, which I'm sure will be printed in the podcast title. I am the only Callie Swanland um, out there as far as I've ever been defined, ever been able to find. So um, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, find me at Callie Swanland. Um, find me at CallieSwanland.com, um, where I also sell fun t-shirts with progressive faith slogans on them, um, like peace be with you and um uh, some fun seasonal ones that I share on there. So you'll find all of that on CallieSwanland.com and you can email me from there or um, uh, invite me out to your neck of the woods. I love collaborating. I love seeing people of faith um, in their own contexts. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of flourishing out there. Thank you so much, Callie. I really appreciate our conversation today. I really appreciate the work that you have put into this book offering and uh, the, the wonderful work that you're doing in your ministry. We always end with a word of peace. So, Callie, may God's peace be with you. God's peace be with you. <laughs> Sounds like your dog. And my dog. A word of my peace dog to did offer that. too. And, and the mail carrier who just came. There is no peace and for the them. mail carrier. <laughs> Thanks, Callie. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go. Do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. 
It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romick-Levitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.